I had the incredible opportunity to interview my mentor and commercial recording studio owner, Anthony Iannucci. Not only has Anthony been working in audio engineering since the late 70s, but he actually started his own licensed school for teaching audio engineering called Unity Gain Recording Institute back in 1989. I graduated from Unity Gain back in 2019, and the experience was absolutely incredible. Because unlike most colleges, you actually get to learn hands-on by working with microphones, a mixing console, and analog gear. Not only that, but you actually get to record real bands. My experience at Unity Gain was amazing and Anthony is an absolute treasure trove of music and audio information. So I was incredibly excited when he agreed to let me interview him for Orpheus Audio Academy. In this part one of our interview, we discuss how to break into the music industry, how to create music that sounds like it came from the 70s or 80s, the best plugins to use, how to develop your critical listening skills, how to set up your home studio on a budget, and best tips and tricks for home studio producers, and a whole lot more. I highly encourage you to watch or listen all the way through the interview as Anthony shares a ton of valuable information that can help you to become a better audio engineer or music producer. Real quick before diving into the interview, if you're looking for a proven step-by-step -step system for mixing professional quality songs from home, then just grab my free rapid song finishing checklist in the description below. All right, let's get to the interview. So, right. Reagan, nice to see you today. Yeah, yeah. Th <laughs> thanks for uh, having me in and doing this, going to this interview. No problem. I know you don't do it for just anyone, only the, the special no. elite people, right? Only the elite people are only allowed, and you are one of them for sure, yes, Reagan. I know. How did you get started with audio engineering? When did you get started? Hmm. Well, I always had this affinity for recording. Um, like in my, I, I, I had played with bands for several years, but then in, um, in 1978, I, I, I kind of pursued it seriously and as an amateur um i noticed they really was seriously no way as there. an amateur yeah well as an amateur beginner i kind of pursued it like how, how would i begin to even develop a career in audio mm -hmm. you know and it, i was running into into dead ends really um because prior to that believe it or not i wanted to actually be a dentist. <laughs> I had some pre-med uh, aspirations. So after two years of like searching and really running into dead ends, I, I entered college and I went to pre-med. And um, about a year in pre-med, I just said, this doesn't feel right. And I, I approached the music department and asked the chairman of the music department if he had any leads on recording and had to become a recording engineer. And he had pointed me to a person who was in charge of the electronic music division of that department. And it wound up that he's a very prestigious person in the industry who I later learned, nicest guy in the world, name is Don Muro. And um, he said, yeah, he goes, I know some people in Manhattan, he goes, specifically a kid, he's about 25, um, and I, I'd like to set you up to meet with him. And I went to Manhattan and met with this guy who had been working in a recording studio. And um, he's like, yeah, you know, the way to really break into this is to kind of look in the back of records of your, you know, your your most, you know, uh, favorite record and see what the, where that engineer is working and then, you know, knock on the door and say, hey, I'd like to, you know, run coffee or run microphone leads. And I'm like, yeah, but is that the only way to learn? He goes, yeah, there's really no way to learn other than, you know, doing that. <laughs> so I said, okay, it sounds a little bit archaic, but I guess that's the way the industry is. Even to this day, sure, we've got schools that teach it, but it's a non-regulated industry. So anybody can say they're a recording studio and anybody can put a sign up and not get locked up. You know, you mm -hmm. can't do that as a dentist, a lawyer, a doctor, an accountant, you know? Yeah. My, my wife with her sisters, they had a band and they, they went to a studio and it was, it was bad. It was really bad. The bad thing about that too, is that it, it creates a bad name in the area, mm -hmm. you know? So outside people who are professional come to Lee County and want to record professionally and then encounter uh, a semi-pro or amateur studio, and then they brand the town as that type of, you know, hmm. town producing that type of talent, which is, you know, disheartening. So I'd like to believe, you know, I'm nowhere near that, that I, I'm maintaining the other oh, yeah. side of the, of the coin, you For know, sure. keeping it, keeping it professional. But, um, yeah, uh, uh, that wasn't very encouraging for me. And, you know, if there was a reason to be discouraged, it was all the things I was running into. Um, and then I was asked to teach through a person I knew on Long Island in Farmingdale uh, at a facility called the Audio Recording Technology Institute. And um, 
I said, teach, and I kind of laughed because typically with me, school, kind of oil and water, you know, they don't really mix. Uh, not because I didn't like education in school, because I always got very nervous with testing mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Yeah, so, I'm anti-school. I'm pro-education, but I'm very anti-school. Well, yeah, that's so. a whole nother podcast now. Which is it? why, yeah, I mean, <laughs> which is why I love your school so much because, I mean, even though it's technically a school yeah. and it's certified and all that, it was, for to me, it was a lot more like an apprenticeship because you're getting hands-on learning in an actual commercial recording studio versus your well, traditional like four year college. That's system. excellent to hear because that's really what I was looking to do is create a very unique school, not one that was so run of the mill. You know, you see that even in regular public school and even private schools where uh, they just so, I don't know, typical, you know, that hands, hands on and working with stuff, you know, really hits home better too, I, I found. And that's in a lot of different to you know, topics and subjects, but yeah, so basically, um, I did take on the challenge of teaching, and it was extremely rewarding to see people go into the market, come back, and say, "Yeah, I'm working here. I'm doing that." It was like, "Wow, it's, that's intense," you know. Then I started doing freelancing. Uh, it was at that facility I met who I consider my mentor, um, and then uh, after a couple of bumps and bumps in the ride, it took a couple of years. I finally started developing the ability to call myself an engineer. Uh, and freelancing was big in New York in the, uh, in the early eighties. Cause really 1982 was the first time I did anything professionally. Um, and, and, uh, I was an, I was an assistant on a, a pretty big album and, um, you know, that's where things st started to take off and I was able to get jobs in other facilities. And so, yeah, it was, uh, it was exciting that things were finally starting to kind of move, but boy, if there's anybody that could have been discouraged easily or needed a reason to be discouraged, it was, it was me for sure. Interesting. So yeah, so you just looked at the record, like you said, and found where it was produced and where you could go and learn. Well, and that's you know, how you kind of got started in the industry. Is that similar today or how would someone who wanted to get into audio engineering or music production, what's kind of the best route? Like we just kind of just mentioned, right? College is usually yeah. the traditional path that people think of taking, but are there alternate ways? Are there better ways in your mind to truly get into the industry? You know, um, like like every industry, um, I think it's important to kind of, you know, to use the phrase, have your guns loaded, basically be ready to be employed. Um, being employed in this industry can come in many different, different ways. I always encourage people to develop relationships, even as a songwriter, as a musician, it's, you can be a, you can be a guitarist and then develop a relationship to get an opportunity to play, let's say with a big act that's touring, but not have developed your style in guitar and lose that job. You know, the same goes with engineering. You can develop a relationship and to get a prestigious job engineering somewhere and then not be ready for it and lose that opportunity. So, you know, with any school, um, the state's real uh, adamant about not promising anybody anything because you can't, you mm -hmm. really can't promise somebody, oh, you're definitely going to be getting a job in this. Uh, but what you can promise them is that you'll be ready to get a job. So, Part of what we do is we we prepare people um, to become employed in, in audio, depending upon what their aspiration is. Where do you want to work? Some people want to stay in the area. Others are free. They're not married. They're not tied down. They can leave. You know, and that's the reason why I'm in I'm in Florida. Um, I I really had no ties in New York except for the relationships I developed. But what's still living at home as an 18 year old and and you know. Uh, looking to purchase a house in the market in the late, the late 80s was certainly a seller's market. It wasn't a buyer's market. Um, and um, my parents had some rental property here. And I said, let, let me go down to Florida and check out my options in Florida, you know. And Lee County at that time was uh, uh, just a, an ever-growing area, especially mm -hmm. with the demographic of, of students that I'd be, that I would later learn that would be the, the basis for my uh, student base, you know. 18 to 35, that type of, you know, they've taught people as old as the high seventies and as young as 13. Hmm. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much, you know, the core of it. So I guess to answer your question and not veer off so much, how would I, what would I advise somebody to do? Really, really understand your craft before you go out and apply anywhere, because I don't think, um, a studio that's ready to hire uh, an engineer is looking for their credentials with respect to schooling more than their raw ability to operate mm. the system. So I experienced that myself when I went for interviews like, okay, great. 
you you worked here, you did that. What can you do? And they want to put you on the board and see what you can do. You know, so everybody. So then, unique. so then, what would be the best way to make sure that your skills are good enough to actually learn a system like this? Well, um, to be ready. You know, more than ever, uh, when I was starting, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have things available like people have available today. The internet's a double-edged sword, though. You can get good information and bad information. Um, I think if you do enough research on a specific topic, for instance, how to use a compressor, you'll probably wind up, if you get 10 opinions mm -hmm. on, on uh, you know, uh, creating an opinion yourself that would be correct because, you know, not everybody's incorrect on the internet. But to rely on just one source may be, may be dangerous. I would say uh, now more than ever, there are several schools throughout the country that are teaching engineering. There are some schools that are outrageously priced. There are ones that are reasonably priced. Um, but in the end, it's a matter of, um, you know, how soon, how quickly do you want to really be educated? Um, what took me five years to learn, I've compacted, uh, and I like to believe better and better each time in a year program. Um, you know, you could learn this stuff on your own, but it's going to take you some time, trials, tribulations, you know, pros, cons. What you don't want to do is learn on clients. Mm. Uh, if you can learn on friends, if you can learn on acquaintances, then of course there's less of a, you know, credibility problem. But when you choose to open up a facility or choose to be a public facility and then take on clients and really don't know what you're doing, then that really puts some serious hurting on your credibility. Okay. So basically just find some kind of mentor and practice. Yeah, I think I think you should look towards somebody who you can trust really knows systems well and at least get tips from mm -hmm. them, you know what I mean? Uh, so that you're able to become proficient, you know, uh, and develop your own style. Each and every person has their own ears and styles and they're influenced from their listening experiences. So it's, it's, um, it's interesting to see over the years, I started the school in 1987, so here it is. We're in, you know, 2020, uh, 2022, and um, I've calculated like over 450 students I graduated, you know. And it's so interesting because they really, each and every one of them were quite unique, including yourself. Whereas I don't feel as they were waiting in line to be employed at the same place. They all mm -hmm. kind of splintered out from working in Europe to South America to the States to Florida, live I mean, and there's so many, so many stories right. of people, you know, I just feel, um, uh, grateful to kind of influence people in a positive way, you know, and I'm sure, uh, I'm positive that each and every one of them learned more since they were here, because that's what the whole process is about is mm -hmm. learning constantly. I'm learning. So certainly they have to be learning. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Especially with all the new technology that keeps yeah. coming up, but yeah, absolutely. Um, so going back to, you so you started out in the seventies and the eighties and that's your, kind of, that kind of like dates me, Reagan. Well, I mean, that's cool. That's actually cool today, right? Because that's that's just the, the music that's in today, True. which you know brings up the question: Was music better in the seventies and eighties, or was it written better? Um, maybe right. We have maybe we have more advanced production that we can do, but even that, um, people feel like there's a certain charm to music in the seventies and the eighties, or maybe it was just written better. More is maybe more complex, whereas today people kind of just seem to be reusing the same stuff, at least with pop music. So I don't know, what's your opinion on you know, music back then versus today? It's, it's, it's kind of a loaded question because um, when I go back to my memories of when I first really heavily got into music with a lot of the classic rock of the era, the 60s, the 70s stuff, I think each era looks back at the previous as better and the era they're currently in as not adequate. And then as time goes on, you look back at the era that you thought was somewhat adequate, you know. For instance, I look back at the 70s and 80s, um, and, you know, I, I was not exactly into disco as a person playing in a band, in a rock band, you know. So it was, you know, an era that was dis disheartening because they took the limelight from a lot of the developing rock acts that were happening in the 70s. Um, and they also changed the direction of music. But a lot of rock bands then conformed to that. You know, the Stones did Some Girls, which was, you know, kind of dancey, you know, kind of incorporated some of the modern sounds. And I think it's healthy, though, for music to kind of morph and, and, uh, and you know, migrate. But even like in, 19, in 1967, Jimi Jimmy Hendrix did All Alone a Watchtower, which is a redo of, you know, of, uh, of Bob, Bob Dylan's song. Mm -hmm. I think the key in redoing any song 
especially as a producer, would be to do it your way. Sure, take the elements that made the song a hit and introduce your concept in it. So if you listen to Bob Dylan's version versus Jimi, Jimi Hendrix's version, they both own their versions, clearly. You know? mm -hmm. um, there are some acts that just ride the wave of, well, we know for sure this is going to be a hit because it was a hit, and they're kind of riding that wave more and don't really put a lot of unique push into it. You know, So... Um, it's, it's a loaded question because we always think that. Um, I thought that the 90s was rather stagnant. Uh, but now as you look back, you see that there were some pretty, you know, important bands that changed the direction of, of rock and dance and pop. And, you know, um, you have dance that's gone through a tremendous amount of, of evolution has changed. And mm -hmm. it's funny how it makes a full circle. Uh, because now we're kind of back to disco, really. You know, right. when you're talking about '80s, you're talking about really disco, and uh, well, people don't like to call it that. No, they have, uh, yeah, they have other terms for it. Yeah, so well, synth pop or correct, synth you wave. Know, because it's not cool, I guess. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know. There's but, new disco. It's oh, called it's called new disco and and you disco. It can't even spell the full full word new. Interesting. That new. Is it like K K N E W? Or? <laughs> I don't know. No, okay. not that kind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, you know, there's Euro pop, and it's um, what it really is. The bot the bottom line is you can label it anything. Um, it's a melting pot. It's a it's a it's a combination of people's experience, uh, and you know what's old is new. What people have not heard is new to them. Mm -hmm. So right. it becomes which is fresh. why we had records come back in, and even. Even tape cassettes. There's some people using. Absolutely, I've seen bands release their their latest album on a tape cassette, and oh, yeah. got a, there's certain you know limited amount. Everyone's got a, they always sell out because it's like a limited number. And it's, it's a funny. It's, it's a funny thing. Yeah. I I have a a friend who owns a drum shop, and I went to his drum shop to visit him. He's like, hey, I I just have a lesson. Could you just watch the front for a minute? I go sure. And this this person walked in. He was a young kid, maybe twenty, and he said, um, hey, I'm looking for this adapter, and he was showing me an R an RCA chord and he hmm. needed a Y chord or something. Oh, sure. So, excuse me, but what are you, what are you doing with that? Cause usually that's analog equipment, unbalanced, high, high beans. And he's like, oh, we're recording on a Fostex A track. I go, you mean the cassette Fostex, like Porta, Porta studio back, you know, back in the eighties. He's like, yeah, it's the hottest thing. I mean, <laughs> well, do you think the quality is good? Yeah, but that's what we're after. See, so people want to be unique. They mm -hmm. want, something no one else has or at least hasn't heard to say hey that's so bad it's good <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah. and that's that's okay that's okay that's with everything from hairstyles to wearing different color socks to you know what i mean mm -hmm. platform shoes and i mean there's so there's so many different uh evolutions of style right. and stuff like that but you know i thought that um the the 60s and even into the 70s was was inspired by the culture of things, you know, the unfortunate mm -hmm. situations with the Vietnam War, and you had a lot of those protest bands with Woodstock and so on and so forth. So that when Desert Storm came and when this whole invasion with Iraq came, very unfortunate and something I was very not very happy about. The one positive I thought would be what it would do culturally with music, mm. and I was surprised it kind of stalled. It didn't really create this incredible new wave of new music and new feel and it just I wonder if because maybe it didn't in, impact people's everyday lives as much as like the vietnam war did that's that's an excellent point it, that very well could be um but you know it's hard when you when the news is dominated by it mm -hmm. and when everything you talk about when somebody comes in the studio is dominated by it you know mm -hmm. and there's strong opinions you know even even today uh, politics, you know, um, we're all American, you know, and there's a lot of people that can't talk about politics. Oh yeah, they get very, very upset, and I'm, I can't quite understand that, you know, like, but why? Why can't we talk? Can't about disagree it? anymore. You can't, you know, and without being all. hateful, right? So. Yeah, it's just so it doesn't. I don't know. It's uh, but even at that, you wouldn't that create some form of music, even if it's anger based, mm -hmm. you know. Um, hmm. I don't know. You know, it's music is interesting and the times are interesting and how culture changes is interesting. I mean, the advent of bell, bell bottoms was a couple of years right. ago where people were coming back with that and it, it was unheard of if you wore that. So I tell, I tell people, you know, there's not, there's no such thing as an outdated song. It's either too early or too late. <laughs> <laughs> it's as simple as that really, you know? Yeah. There's definitely a nostalgia factor. That's what like the synthwave genre is definitely 
a big part of it is absolutely nostalgia influence. So if someone did want to create music that sounded like it came from the seventies or the eighties, there's probably a better way than, than buying expensive equipment that came from the actual eighties, like that, yeah, that tape machine you mentioned. So what's, what are some maybe software or what are some processes that people can go through to make their music sound more like it came from the seventies or the eighties? So again, I wish I had silver bullet answers. The problem is, Really? Well, no, that's, that's what I appreciate because it's, it's yeah. definitely a nuanced question. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, pro- the problem is really understanding the texture of sound from that era. So when you sit back and think about it, um, the texture of the recordings of the 20s, the, the swing era, mm-hmm. the 40s, the 50s, when Elvis came and introduced rock and, rock and roll, what, what does that sound like out of your stereo? And then when the 60s came and the Beatles exploring all different th- and the advent and the redevelopment of equipment, what made that sound different than Elvis's stuff? And then the 70s, when people were really exploring, you know, machines were becoming much, much more dynamic in, in, in range. Groups like Led Zeppelin, the drum, like the drum sounds there. And, and even in the 80s, we have disco, the bass that was never, ever obtained. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Now is this tremendous amount of bass. And then we can keep talking about it as we go into the 90s. And then we have that, you know, the merging of Run DM- DMC with Aerosmith and this whole melting of different styles. And it's like the music is also indicative of what technically can be, can happen, you know? So now to answer your question more focused, how can you kind of get a 70s, 80s texture? First, you've got to understand how those sounds sounded. So it doesn't even matter genre wise, you know, uh, was it, you know, pop, was it the cars, you know, or was it something more synth dance based or was it disco using synths, you know, what was the overall commonality in there, you know, and you'll notice that it's diminished dynamic range, meaning mm-hmm. bass to treble and also an overall smokiness to it. That was like, um, I guess can be compared to five, five K video versus film. Mm-hmm. What Quentin Tarantino's doing, using digital filters to make it look analog, right. from scratches in film to the blurriness of it. There's a certain something about that that's, that you can connect with, even though it doesn't seem as real as some of the real crisp 5K stuff. Right. It's, it's, more, it's more natural to you. You know what I mean? Because I, I don't know where our optics work. I don't know, you know? But it's the same thing audio-wise. Um, there's a certain dynamic range that's just that's just indicative of the area so, uh, of the era. So, what you need to do is understand that, and then work within that parameter. Now, a lot of people be like, "Well, is it just that dynamic range?" No, because the equipment created a texture. Tape created a texture that digital does not do, mm-hmm. which is why we see the advent of a lot of these emulators, these tape emulators. Right. Um, we see a big, big wave nowadays in 2022 of saturation modules. Mm-hmm. Um, what they are are recreations of ex- experiences we had as engineers with analog equipment and their limitations. Distorting tape was something that an uh, engineer like Eddie Kramer capitalized on. He, that was his signature. Hmm. Work it to the edge. Not to the point it's horrible, but just so it's edgy. And, you know... Even like the Beastie Boys, you know, they cut their signature racket uh, on Radio Shack microphones, <laughs> purposely distorting the preamps in those mics for the texture of that. Interesting. Working on a, on a Fat Boys racket in the late 80s, um, same exact thing. They were overdriving the preamps at the console for a unique sound. So understanding how things are worked in an orthodox way and then breaking those rules is art. It's, it's mm-hmm. not a problem. You know, who's to tell Picasso, hey, that head's on backwards. <laughs> Can't do that. You know what I mean? <laughs> Can't do that. That's debatable. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> See, teach his own. Yeah. Interesting. So, yeah. So you mentioned, uh, right, tape saturation. What are some, maybe some of your favorite saturation modules that you use? Um, well, um, I'm a little partial to wave stuff. Um, the, and you test for waves, right? So you actually been, get, you been, get all the plugins before they get yeah, released. I've, I've been testing for waves. Um, since about nine, since about 20, uh, I think about 2006, I started t- testing for Waves and brilliant company. You know, when you compare plugins, it's really how they're developed and like their algorithms, you know, how much detail has gone into the development of them. Today's modeling is just amazing how they can model a piece of equipment. 
But for instance, with Waves, they first introduced the Kramer machine, which was the Eddie Kramer version of how the Ampex, how we use an Ampex machine. And when they first introduced it to me, um, I listened to it and said, this concept is brilliant. But then when I listened to it, to be honest, as a tester, I, I didn't think it really quite made made the grade. You know, I was like, this doesn't really sound like what yeah, you have it an, should sound it's like. It's like you have an Ampex on the wall there behind oh, you. Yeah. Like I, you know, I've, I, I've worked with those machines, so it's like only working with them can you really experience it. So the average person who has not worked with them, you can tell them this is, this is the way it sounded. And they're like, oh, okay, you know. Mm -hmm. But somebody like me, you, you're going to have to really emulate something that's going to sound like that feeling, like that sound I got. And that's probably why for them, I'm a valuable tester or many like me are valuable testers uh, for vintage stuff, you know. And um, they actually shelved it. I, I would not say it was because of my suggestion, but because many others that were also testing probably had the same similar, you know, response. They asked lots of questions. Why? What is it? You know, what is it, why does it not sound the way it does? What do you think we should do to make it sound better? And um, they went back to the drawing board, got another machine and really went deeper into modeling. And I mm -hmm. think that that plugin specifically was a landmark plugin for them to really understand how to model aspects of analog gear to recreate a virtual version of them. And uh, when they came back with the second version about a year ago, I was like, uh, a year after, I was like, wow, mm -hmm. that's amazing. What? I had questions for them. How'd you guys do that? Would you, you know, and it was, it, 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 it's amazing. So when like, when like the, you know, when the 37, which is the Beatles machine came out and all the task games came out and all, mm -hmm. it was amazing because they already had that technology down. They just had to go through what they did already. You know what I mean? So it wasn't reinventing the wheel, but it was redesigning the different wheel that rolls, you know? So it was amazing. Uh, so like, there's a lot of saturators in the past that, ah, you know, um, if you understand distortion and saturation, there's even harmonic and not harmonic distortions. And traditionally, even harmonic distortions are a little more pleasing to the ear. They're fluffier. They're kind of smoother. Example, uh, the band Boston from the 70s, you know, be big guitars, very listenable. Mm -hmm. Whereas you have, you know, Nirvana from, you know, from, let's say the 90s, uh, edgier, you know, more you know, art harmonic distortion. So a mm -hmm. lot of people would listen to those genres of music because it's more aggressive to be edgy. It's less aggressive to be smoother, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of music. It pushes you into moods you may, you may want to be in or change to because you're in another mood. You're depressed. You'd like to be in a more excited mood. You're excited. You'd like to relax to go to sleep, you know? Mm -hmm. Music's powerful like that, you know? So um, yeah, you know, there's lots of modules out there now. IK Multimedia has got some great, great saturators. Mm -hmm. uh, Waves just developed. We just actually, we just released a couple of new ones, um, the Magma ones. They're really, really nice. Um, you know, and depending upon how dramatic you want it to be or how subtle you want it to be. The Butch Vig plugin was released a couple of years ago. And although it says for vocals, you can use it on anything, mm -hmm. but you can create a transistory sounding distortion or a vacuum tube type even overdrive distortion or even blend them, which is a beautiful thing. It was, you, it was either or years ago. Now these options are incredible. Mm -hmm. I think there's more options out there than people realize. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's new saturators coming out all the time but so. in, in gear in general i mean when somebody says to me i say so which are you using and they say logic and i say wow um have you been through you know have you worked with with their engines have you worked with the you know with a lot of their development tools and stuff like that you know alchemy and stuff like that I love alchemy and they're like oh uh, yeah but they kind of you know i've heard them all they have no clue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're just starting points. You can do anything right, with presets. those shapes. Yeah, there's, yeah, it's very, anything. Yeah. Nowadays with synths, and the biggest problem with synths, in my opinion, um, is that you're given too many presets. Mm -hmm. um, you should be giving minimal presets and you should be forced to explore. And I, I fall, you know, I, I'm one, I also, you know, fall into a situation where I'm going through presets before I modify because everybody would like a quicker fix, you know, mm -hmm. because I'm looking for something, but it's not quite, quite there. So I get to a preset that's close and then I go and modify. A lot of people get to the best preset of the bunch are not happy with it and settle for it. Mm -hmm. Understanding um, the nature of oscillators, of ring modulators, of, of, you know, of how the envelope generators work mm -hmm. in synthesizers is so important.
And a lot of people just preset six, five, one, two, you know, mm -hmm. and go for sounds. Uh, so there's some tremendous synthesizers out there now, and there's re even hardware synths that are being re reissued. Um, that physically you've got to physically adjust. Oh, the Nord is yeah. you, know, you know a great mm -hmm. one. You know. Yeah, no, I mentioned IK. They've come out with a couple. Oh yeah, Centronic. I mean, IK's got some great stuff. They they revamped their line, and uh, I have tremendous respect for IK. They got great stuff, um, instrument wise and plug in wise. You know, guitars. Nowadays, it really doesn't pay to have amplifiers in the studio anymore. Pianos, to keep a piano tuned in the studio, the amount of real estate it takes up and to keep it tuned right. when you can take the data and instantly choose a Bosendorf or, or you know, mm -hmm. a German Grand or a Steinway. It's amazing. I mean, and really, really sounding real good. Yeah. I'm very much a naturalist. I don't like synthetically recreated things that I can obtain naturally. But in the case of guitar amplification now, in the case of Pianos, got to tell you, with a weighted keyboard, you can pretty mm -hmm. much put up a curtain and trick any anybody. You know that's, you know. and even classicists, even real seasoned people like I work with Dave Brubeck. I said, Dave, Dave, what what type of piano do you have at home? He says a Roland, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and here's a guy who's gonna go down, right. you know, history books over 140 LPs and work with everybody. A jazz great. Uh, but when he did record with me, he did wheel in a German grand because that is, that, that is his roots, you know, but mm -hmm. practice and playing and it's amazing. There's some amazing things out there, but there's a pretty big choice of saturators. There used to be real cheap plugins and then high end plugins. Now the, the race is on, you know, because mm -hmm. I think they've reverse engineered, uh, you know, the real good guys and, and they've improved their ability to be a good plugin. So people don't realize is that with digital um, you've got a precious 16 bits in the end that you need to produce for the client. Mm -hmm. And uh, a plugin, a bad plugin can wreck that, mm. can totally destroy that. And, and now there's a compromise. The compromise would be audible. Um, the visual equivalent would be watching a movie and you see blotchy, a blotch of black or something. You know, that's, that's a compromise in the, vi in the video, whatever was applied, uh, or the copy. Uh, in audio, it could be a chattering of reverb or it could be a, uh, uh, an inadequate or abnormal sound at low volume, stuff like that. You know, so you just so. have to really pay attention when you're using that to, to listen, listen for yeah. that. Yeah, well, develop that critical hearing. Also, the key is to work at a higher resolution. Hmm. If you're working at 24 bit, not to say you could be flagrant, but you can, you know, worry less that you're going to wind up with a pure 16 bit because you're going to knock out eight in the end. Right. Okay. And you mentioned. DAWs earlier, like a lot of people say it doesn't really matter what DAW you use. Do you have an opinion on that? Are there some that are better yeah. than others in certain circumstances? I think that um, I think that the digital audio work workstation, which is what a DAW is, is, is really a um, it's a recreation virtually of what we used to do with the mixer. And just like the question would be asked back in the eighties before DAWs, let's say, uh, well, what mix do you really prefer? It's a matter of your preference, you know. Um, the DAWs themselves. For me, it's all about editing. You know, I come from the school of when I had to assemble things. And really, audio editing is almost like if you, if you make the um, analogy to painting, the work's not in spraying the paint. The work's in preparing. Mm -hmm. So prepping a job is where a lot of the real heavy work is. Spraying is <laughs> staying right. there and just, you know, and it's rewarding because your, your preparation work made the job come out good. But you prepare it not real good and then you spray and then you see edges now are bleeding over to others and in audio that also happens where you don't check your rhythms you don't check your pitches you stack things and now they sound and you know typically we are we're mixing for a fifth grade level listener not to diminish the education of anybody who's listening but it's like technically they don't understand what we do mm -hmm. all they know is it sounds good or it sounds bad Mm -hmm. And we know as technical people, if we, um, you know, can be superior to that fifth, fifth grade listening level, that for sure we'll have a good sounding product, you know? So as far as doors go, do you have a door that's serving the purpose you're, you've set out to record with? For instance, um, are you alone and um, looking for sounds and are you a self creator? Are you going to be programming your drums and your bass and your synth parts and, you know, recording minimally, let's say live sounds like vocals and stuff. I, I don't really think that there's a door out there that equals logic, especially mm -hmm. for the money. 
um, coming with over, you know, 50 gig of, of license-free sounds and amazing abilities to just modify things. Yeah, I've used um, several different, and Logic's definitely my favorite, because that's a yeah. lot of why I, I do all my own yeah. sounds. And but, you know, anything. it's not better for any other reason but the workflow. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the workflow preference for me with a band would be digital performer only because it, it does not discriminate track type. It could be a band that's a full blown band, bass, drums, guitar, vocals, background, saxophones, and then now synthetic sounds, uh, MIDI instruments stacked. Um, we're going to trigger drums to stack onto acoustic drums, whatever. Um, that, that program is set up brilliantly in that everything's very, very linear. Everything's in the same window, not like. A program like let's say logic where you treat your audio differently than you treat your mm -hmm. mini right that becomes to me a frustrating aspect of logic if i'm in that genre of record you mm -hmm. know if i'm in midi recording logic is such a great tool because there's unlimited quantization mm -hmm. you can undo redo it's it's brilliant it really is so i think it's depending upon where you want to be you know then there are people like read about things like, oh, the industry standard pro tools, or, you know, if you're in PC, Cubase, you know, uh, developed by, you know, Steinberg. And um, again, they're all workflow preferences. Mm -hmm. And you have to say to yourself, for what I'm doing, is this the easiest way to do it? And some people learned a more difficult way to do it, and they're more adverse to changing their way. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah. yeah. There's a little bit of a learning curve when you have to have a new dock because everything's not quite where you're, you're used to it being in different places. But isn't that the case if you fly to a state and you rent a car? Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of a learning curve. Where's gas cap release? Where's the... I did it the other... I went to New York. I'm like... Yeah, you got to sit there for I gotta a while. I got to put gas in it. What's going on? Especially for someone like me who hasn't owned a car that was made this century yet. So it's <laughs> yeah, like, right. you get a rental car, you're like, what is this spaceship? Exactly. <laughs> so, you're like, well, you know, and it's like, um, you know, I just borrowed my parents' car, my, my mom's car. And it's like... I went to put gas in it and I'm like, where's the gas cap, <laughs> you know? And you got to look at the little gas, oh, it's that way, you know? And then when you get out of the car, you open the hood, like, somebody, somebody stole the cap. No, it's capless, you know, you, they don't have caps anymore. You know, they just shut us, they just close it, you know? And so those are so insignificant to the main point of mm -hmm. putting gas in the vehicle, <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. They're just little hiccups. And I think that's the key is learning um, in a more generic way, so you're not pigeonholed into just working this program. Mm -hmm. How many people who still, um, they were taught or they self-taught on a certain program still stay away from certain knobs and buttons and areas because they're like, oh, I don't know about that, but you know, if I don't touch it, I'm cool. Mm -hmm. you know? that, that should not be the case. You should understand that and then explore other ones to understand where your strength would lie for your preference, depending upon what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So just like what you said, you can work with Reason, you can work with Cubase, you can work with Tools, you can work with Performer, and then work with Logic. And for what you're doing, Logic is the best choice. Why not? Because it's better or worse, but it's got the, it's got the vehicle, it's got mm -hmm. the, the tools you need right. uh, to work efficiently. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Speaking of tools in, in DAWs, like, mm -hmm. how far can you get with just like the stock plugins that come with a DAW? Or, and when when should you upgrade and actually buying plugins, whether it be Waves or IK or, or mm -hmm. someone else? Like how far yeah. should you just get as far as you can go with the stock plugins and how far is that? It's a great question. And I think that, um, you know, my, my um, door of preference is Digital Performer because of where I'm from and what the dominance of what I do is for the most part. Um, over the years, I've seen a tremendous uh, improvement because let's face it, um, as a competing DAW with other DAWs in the industry, you're always looking to get the leg up on the next guy. Mm -hmm. So I think that more and more, and I see that with every version released with every DAW, um, there are more and more plugins that are being released that are good quality plugins to use. And um, for example, um, Digital Performer would have the George Massenberg plugins, uh, which is the Masterworks series, which is an awesome series. But much like you develop a relationship with, see, the frequency equalizer to us engineers is like the paintbrushes to the artist. Sure, there's different canvases and different quality paints, and there's even incandescent paints and invisible paint. But the bottom line is the brush is your stroke tool. And the EQ is our stroke tool. And it's the reason why I'm still using a console that I purchased back in 1987 because there's a certain relationship I've developed with the EQ that I can pull out things in my mind mm. um, easily. And not to say it's the only one in the world, it's the best one in the world, it's one I've become 
in tune with that every time I go to the audio engineering convention, I'm always looking, you know, thinking, okay, now what if, you know, a missile came from the air and blew up the you know, console <laughs> or a console was rendered useless? Uh, where, where would I go next? And, and that's a very, very hard, hard thing. So my suggestion would be most every plugin uh, and every software out there gives you a trial period. My, my suggestion would be to utilize the trial period to really do some critical analysis. You know, listen to how this EQ sounds stock, then get an EQ without purchasing it, but just in trial, and listen to how the same source, because you have to compare apples to apples, mm -hmm. how EQing the same source with that one came out. Right, in the same settings or same EQ settings. Correct. You can't, you, you, you can't have a different situation because mm -hmm. then it's not fair to really do comparative analysis. But, you know, then raises the question, what am I looking for? Which is what a lot of my students would be like, well, I know how to operate this EQ, but what is it exactly I'm doing and what is it I'm looking for? And that raises a whole nother issue of analysis, critical listening, the ability to really listen to something um, that you like and then be able to emulate that in your head. So when you and I are sitting here and I, you know, I say to you a synth pop kick of today, a synth pop kick of the 80s, mm -hmm. a new disco kick, a new disco kick, kick meaning the kick drum of the drum kit uh, of yesteryear, the overall bass texture, the overall sound texture of a song in the 80s versus today if it's dance. You know, in your mind should pop images that you would then use your tools to emulate. Mm -hmm. If you've not developed those images, how valuable the tools to you. You can say you've got the greatest tools and bought the biggest, most expensive pack, but if you don't know how to use them, mm -hmm. what, what true value are they to you? So it's use, experience, analysis, analyzing is so critical. There's not a day that doesn't pass that I don't listen to something I did in a critical way, not to pat myself, oh, that's great, Andrew, but what would I have done different if I do this again? So how do you do that? How do you listen in a critical way? I listen, well, first, um, having a, a control room, um, like when you're sitting in that's tuned, tuned meaning, you know, the ear is a nonlinear tool, meaning our ears are not, are not perfect. Um, depending upon the level you're listening to my voice, I've got more or less bass in reality because of the way the ear is developed, meaning at different volumes, the ear perceives certain frequency sets, bass, treble, mids differently. With that known, good news is everybody's got the same ear, ear makeup. The bad news is if we all create at different levels, we've got a problem with consistency in the market, right? So what you need to do is listen at a consistent level at things you, you revere as, you know, the best sounding out there on whatever system you listen to. It's important. It could be a cheap system. It doesn't have to be expensive, but it's consistency. Mm. So you listen on a system that you consider broken. It's got a broken speaker even, right? But you're consistent with listening on it. You now deem, okay, this is acceptable base. Now you listen to your product comparatively. Does it match up? Right. So having a reference, basically. You have to, mm -hmm. you know. So having a room that's tuned um, will assure you that when you bring product outside, it's going to be as mainstream and neutral as it can. Are you going to satisfy every listening environment? No. Um, because there's such a diversity from earbuds to little Bose speakers that create tremendous bass to mm -hmm. very large stadium, you know, speakers line arrays and so on and so forth. So you try to create a middle ground. For me, even in a tuned room, it's monitoring between the small, in my case, NS10Ms, Yamahas, and then the larger Yuri timer lines. Believe it or not, if, um, if I were to choose one over the other to have to just use as a sole monitor, it would probably be the smaller ones because I think the smaller ones are more repre you know, representative of what the mm -hmm. average person's listening through. Um, you know, the 90s brought an interesting twist in listening because when Steve Jobs introduced the iPod, he introduced, reintroduced earbuds or headphones, mm -hmm. and that changed the whole course of how right. things were going to work in the future. We were on, on the precipice of working with surround sound, and then Steve Jobs changed the direction of the vehicle completely into binaural listening. Mm -hmm. which I think is healthy. You know, there's a lot of research in binaural image listening, and it does fascinate me how we're able to perceive direction and depth with just two ears. All right. That's, yeah. You know, that's something that personally I'm, I'm fascinated with, but surround sound you'll notice is, is kind of sparse. It's, 
it's found mostly in, in motion, motion picture. That is, if the playback facility, if the surround sound theater, IMAX theater supports mm -hmm. hours mixed. Because normally when you receive a surround sound program, there's multiple mixes layered in there. Mm -hmm. There's seven one, there's 11, then there's two. There's always a stereo one. So there's a fallback or there's a fallback too. So if the facility doesn't have the true surround system, you can still hear it in stereo. Okay. Yeah. So you mentioned so yeah, tune room. So what if someone's on a budget, what's the kind of the best mm -hmm. way and they're just working out of their bedroom? Mm -hmm. What's the best way to kind of create the best listening environment? Yeah. I got to tell you this, some, um, you know, um, IK has got a system called ARC, the ARC 3 system that it's like a hundred dollars. It's very reasonable to just make sure your room's tuned. Um, they give you a MEMS mic, they give you a mic with the software, and you're able to kind of, they tell you where to place and where to measure with a ruler, your position, listening position in the room, and um, it gives you a, a very, very good uh, approximation of how things should sound. There's an auto EQ it, and then at that point, uh, you incorporate that in your listening environment, you know? So, so, yeah, so what that's doing, I guess for someone who doesn't know yeah, what tuned room sure. is, it's like listening to how sounds respond in your room and it's applying a, an eq curve so it's creating a more linear what you're hearing is more linear you're not hearing like you're not being tricked basically your ears like if you're if there's a lot of bass leaving your room it would eq a little bass boost so that when you're mixing you're not adding too much bass is that like a good you, you know stuff pretty good you, you've been you've been uh, taught huh no, I, so, <laughs> I'm, I'm a good teacher yeah no you're absolutely right um it's so important to know that. That's like one of the basic things to know is that you can be tricked very easily. Sound travels quick. And uh, yeah, what this tool does is it, it, it basically listens to what your ears are listening to and then makes corrections so that you're not being tricked. What you're listening to is a good representation of what you would hear outside. It's, um, it's a pretty good tool. It used to be that you'd have to rent a spectrum analyzer. Gold was one of the biggest companies years ago or buy one for thousands. Um, and then by a pink, you know, pink noise, which is your measuring stick, equal energy per octave and a special spectrum, you know, analysis microphone to what we call strike the room and make sure the room, uh, you know, is sounding good. Um, there are much more accurate professional ways to go than ARC, but talking about the person working from home, mm -hmm. ARC is an incredible tool. That's one of the biggest problems we really have is, uh, consistency in rooms. Uh, the same engineer can go to a different room, use his or her technique, and listen the same way for the moment, and bring it outside and it'd be different because it's so easy to be tricked. Sounds mm -hmm. traveling so quick within that space that you're not, you can't notice it mm -hmm. until it's too late. Right. So is that, I guess, an adequate step? Or like, what about putting up foam on the walls, right? You see a lot of beginners just kind of throwing up foam on the walls. Yeah. Because yeah. that's well, what you're supposed to do, right? Yeah. Well, you know, um, if you think about, um, you know, I always tell my students, think about how um, balls, a series of balls in a room would react if I threw a handful of soup balls against the wall. How, would, how manic would they be or how controlled would they be? If I took a big medicine ball and lobbed it into the wall, how many times would that bounce if I took a volleyball and threw it, you know? Mm -hmm. So if you can use the vision of that, of how things would react in your room. And the, and the analogy would be the big medicine ball for low frequency bass, the volleyball for mid frequencies or frequencies in the tone center, and then the super ball for the high frequencies. It gives you an idea of how things react. So use common sense. Too much reflection in a room is going to create too much of the super ball effect. Mm -hmm. Too much absorption in the room is going to create too much of uh, a non-reactive, a non-reflective you know, effect. So a balance. You like to create a nice balance in a room. There's a little reflection, not too much, because depending upon the size of the room, uh, it's like filling up a car with lots of balloons. That Those balloons are no longer going to be circular. They're going to mm -hmm. start to turn shape to conform in that area. Mm -hmm. You know, If you put just a few smaller balloons in a the car, they'll float independently and they will retain their shape. So I'm does, a, it, does it matter where you put then if you put up some absorption like sound panels mm -hmm. on the wall, what, what, that's where great, should you that's start? That's a great question. Um, you have to think, well, now the guns or what's shooting the sound out, which are your speakers, is really key to consider. Um, by putting soundproofing behind the speakers, not nearly as effective, although sometimes necessary, than in the front of where they're throwing. So again, think of, you know, 
Think of water. Another thing beside the ball analogy would be think of water. If water was shooting out like a cannon out of those speakers, they would go against the first wall they hit, and then they would bounce secondarily, and then mm -hmm. in a third way, in a fourth way. So really using your vision on how sound would look uh, would, be, would be an important way to do it as well. In the end, you can guess whatever you want. I've done scientific room developments and so on and so forth and designs. Um, in the end, when you spectrum analyze, depending upon how much frequency boost or cut is necessary to make your room right, would be dependent upon uh, how well you put your, you calculated your uh, hard and soft surface application. So if you saw a tremendous dip in frequency, so you had to boost a lot to make it right, mm -hmm. it means you got too much absorption. Okay. If you saw a tremendous boost in your frequency, it would mean there's too much reflection, time to rethink your strategy. Okay. So yeah, continuing on along those lines, and you have lots of students that come through, what are some like common beginner mistakes you see when it comes to mixing? Well, uh, not understanding some of the basics of what we call the Fletcher Munson curve, uh, the nonlinearity of the ear. So the frustration level with not only trying to figure out the equipment and the right mic and the right you know, situation that we had to handle the signal, but then muscling out something that sounds good only to then bring it to the outside environment and be disappointed it's not good. So a lot of it is the misunderstanding of how the ear works, um, which then frustrates, you know, the person. Because yeah, it's easy yeah. to go out and buy the stuff <laughs> mm -hmm. and easy to be sold the stuff, but it's not as easy to figure out how to use it right. Okay. So just listen, listening at the right volume level and while Absolutely. Can solve a lot of a lot of problems. A then. lot of problems. Too loud or too low? Yeah. Even a tuned room listening too loud or too low can uh, get you in trouble. Okay. You're adding too much or too little bass treble. All right. What about like secret pro hacks? Because surely there's just like a secret pro hack that you do to make Regular, things sound I like professional. To, I, I like to not be called a hack in any way, actually. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, about, that's what people like to say. I, that I know, the I know. Hacks, I'm so. joking with you. Yeah. Um, well, um, you know, I, I got to tell you, I treat every recording for what's necessary. There are people that just set up boilerplate, meaning regular plug-in arrangements and regular. Sure, I've got uh, plug-in racks and a certain order of certain things I do on a regular basis, and I may start with that. But it's so important to me to look at that individual job, you know. Um, it, it depends. Um, are they sounds you're capturing? Is it something you're restoring? Um, you know, all, all I would suggest is that you really look at the plugins that you consider purchasing after your analysis and realize even the difference between them. One of the things as a tester of waves that amazes me is like, in reality, there's only three effects. Reverberation, delay, echo, and pitch, pitch-based effects. Three, that's it. And then there's only three signal controllers or mm -hmm. devices that tame your signal, compressors, uh, expanders, which are called noise, noise gates, and limiters. And it's amazing that I'm testing like 650 plugins. Right now, right? <laughs> I'm like, well, even if you divide them up, that's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot. It's a hundred and something, 200 and something plugins per genre, you know? And what I've come to realize is that they are brilliant in creating different textures, different approaches to that, uh, to that uh, application. Uh, so different reverberation systems, emulating different types of reverb systems, um, different uh, delay approaches, emulating old school delays coupled with new school delays and mixing abilities, hybrids usually. Some of my favorite plugins are the hybrid plugins because okay. you're able to choose a modern approach, a retro approach, or a mix of them both. So what are, what are some of those plugins? Um, well, appropriately called hybrid by ways. <laughs> the H plugins, um, HEQ. You know, typically with an equalizer, you, you pick um, your favorite EQ. In this case, is a European EQ. Um, and it's of one make, meaning it's of one makeup. Its bandwidth is set, its frequency range is set, its ability to boost and cut, which is the whole basis of equalization, is set. Um, with a hybrid EQ, you can have that, or you can say, okay, 
I've got a multi-band EQ, which is what your EQ is. Let's say it's a four band, five band, six band. I can make band one American, band two Euro European, band three a cross mm -hmm. between them. Band so you're truly creating a mutt, but something you would need lots of vintage EQs to do and wouldn't be real practical running the entire right. EQ just to use a band through. So those abilities, I, I, I don't think a lot of people even realize what it is. Mm -hmm. Oh, hybrid. Must be like those electric cars mm -hmm. that drive yeah. out there. So they have no idea what really was going on. And as you become more educated uh, and working with that, same thing with compression, a big thing is bus compression, mm -hmm. parallel compression, series compression. It's understanding those terms. Right. What is parallel? What is series? What's the bus? You know? Mm -hmm. Then you understand the value of bus compression. Until right. then, it becomes just a term and, oh, this is cool. Listen, this is a new one I got, you know. It's easy to play, real, and mm -hmm. I, I do a degree of that too because that's how you learn. But then there comes a point where you've got to say, well, why would I use this? What application mm -hmm. would I use this one over that one? So I'm that passionate and adamant about specific choices depending upon what I'm up against. I assess the situation. I may pull up a certain plugin and say, okay, one of my favorite plugins for like a transparency in taming this signal would be the Renaissance compressor that Waze puts out. And um, I may want the compressor to be more aggressive because this is a player or a singer that's instantaneously aggressive. So maybe the Renaissance is a little too soft in its ability to reduce that gain that's getting, getting out of control. I may go to an LA-2A, you know, to a universal audio plugin, which would be more aggressive and attack the situation, mm -hmm. clamp it, you know. But some of those terms are not known right. if you don't understand what compression is. So it's really a matter of, Number one, understanding the fundamentals yes. then of the entire process of, yep. of mixing and processing, and then also understanding uh, what the problems are, what needs fixed, and then understanding also what your tools are and what your tools can do. Absolutely. You've got, you know, like any mechanic, right? Mm -hmm. You have all these tools and somebody says, I've got a problem with my car. And you pretty much before seeing it say, I bet you it's this. Then when it comes in, you look at the specifics, you test it. You analyze and say, okay, this is what I need to do to fix it, you know? Same thing. I'm, I'm the king of analogies, by the way, if you haven't mm -hmm. noticed by now. <laughs> oh, they're, they're helpful. They're good. It does. It just helps everyday things. Oh, okay. That's what he means. Because mm -hmm. sometimes you get caught in a technical jogging. You get right. For sure. Yeah. Especially for me, it's like saying beginner. if and the, but, you know, mm -hmm. when I say frequency, amplitude, wavelength, a lot of people, that's not a normal language for them. You know? Right. So it's, yeah. If you got value from this interview, feel free to drop a like and let me know any questions you have in the comments section below. Again, if you want a proven step-by-step -step system for producing professional quality music from home, then just grab my rapid song finishing checklist in the description below. By the way, I'll be uploading part two of this interview very soon. And if it's already up, you'll be able to click on it on the screen right now. Otherwise, if you want more tips and tricks for producing pro quality music from home, I also have a playlist on the screen that you can check out right now. All right, have a great day and keep creating.